Hello, I'm Kathy Nash with the ACES staff, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is entitled um, the Getty Vocabulary Open Refine. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm reading it off your slide. The Getty Vocabulary Program's Open Refine Reconciliation Service from Users to Contributors, and this is sponsored by DCMI and ACES. Our distinguished presenter today is Jonathan Ward. Our moderator is Jacob Jett, and he is the DCMI webinar coordinator. I'd like to ask the audience, as you have questions today, please type them into the question box you'll see on your screen, and Jacob will moderate those questions at the end of the presentation, and Jonathan will answer those. Um, I'd now like to turn the session over to Jacob, who's gonna introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so, so Jacob Jett, I'm the webinar coordinator for the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. Uh, and we have here with us today, Jonathan Ward from the Getty. Uh, he is the senior editor of the Getty Vocabulary Program, uh, where he has over 20 years of experience working with the source construction and terminologies for the arts and museum community. Um, he has uh, a master's in library and information science from San Jose State University and is currently the vice chair for CIDOC, which is ICOM's International Committee for Documentation, uh, which is involved in museum metadata um, standards. Uh, and without further ado, I'm gonna turn the session over to Jonathan. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks all of you for, for coming. Uh, it's, I hope everybody is well and, and healthy. Um, I feel like I'm sort of always getting used to these online meeting environments and uh if any of you are in the southwest right now not only is there kind of a brutal heat wave but there's rolling blackouts and there's tons of fires and there's a pandemic so you know, we'll just you know we'll try to do the best that we can um i hope that i come through clear when i'm presenting i'm going to go over a lot of material some of it is very advanced and i don't expect anybody to immediately catch on to it it's more there for just to show the the abilities of the service itself um, to use at a later date if, if you need um and uh so yes as jacob said thank you um i'm happy to be here uh, it's really nice to be invited. I am the senior editor of the Getty Vocabulary Program, and um, I will be going by a script, so I will be constantly looking down. I, I don't have the improv skills to push through a full hour staring at the camera, but uh, I thought it best anyway, just to keep things rolling. Um, so what I'm gonna present today is a tutorial on our new OpenRefine reconciliation service. Um, that's for aligning data records to the vocabularies, uh, specifically focusing on uh, terms found in ULAN, the Union List of Artist Names, the AAT, the Art and Architecture Thesaurus, and TGN, the Getty Thesaurus of Geographic Names. In the interest of time, I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar with the vocabularies. So, what I will do first is give a broad overview of the OpenRefine software in the context of the vocabularies, how it can be beneficial in a general sense, and then I'll run uh, several reconciliation examples to show you the service in its basic form, how it works, how it might help your work. Um, then I will actually have a sort of brief diversion to discuss contributing to the Getty vocabularies. These things kind of go hand in hand. Um, we receive contributions from a variety of institutions. In fact, the vocabularies really are built on, uh, on contributors' data. Um, but I guess OpenRefine presents a good opportunity for both streamlining data for one's own purposes and also for contributions. So we're gonna to touch into that. And then after that, I'll present sort of a deeper dive into OpenRefine with some advanced functions and applications that the software can provide uh, that hopefully some of you may find useful. But if, you know, if they're so advanced that it just seems too far down the line, then 
uh, you know, it can be there just to be used as kind of a guideline. Um, some of those examples are actually answers to questions that we regularly receive from contributors and users. So that's why I've chosen them. Um, I've learned that doing a demo, a live demo of the OpenRefine service is a little tricky. I didn't want to do that. So I'll be showing a lot of screenshots. Um, that sometimes means that you might be squinting a little. I hope not. Uh, but hopefully I can, we're going to make this presentation available later. And, you know, in case you're interested, you can follow that. Okay. So the Open Refine service was something we'd actually been exploring for a while because it would give us a chance to do a few things. We've always been looking to engage more of our users in a way that's helpful and meaningful. The vocabularies have many types of users, but the specific users we're targeting here are a core base of museum, library, and institutional catalogers and metadata and information specialists, specifically usually having to do with the art world and research. They may use the vocabularies in collection management systems or in conjunction with local thesauri uh, or local systems, or they may simply grab our vocabulary IDs online and populate their own data with it. Uh, we also wanted to improve the flow of contributions, uh, making it easier for institutions to add their data and terminologies to the vocabs, to make it easier to create consistent data overall, um, which most of us want to do. And I'm sure all of us know that museum and library data can get tricky and messy and filled with legacy issues. So we wanted a way to make that easier, basically, and uh, improve the quality of everyone's data. And an open refined service in a way can make it easier for us editors to directly engage with the contributors themselves, their data, and work with them directly if needed. It should be mentioned that um, while we're consistently one of the most popular services that Getty provides, um, and the program actually as a whole is over 30 years old, um, we're a very small staff of four people. Uh, so we need to continually be looking ahead to engage users and institutions and find ways to improve on our end. So from the top, OpenRefine is a free open source data wrangling software that once it's installed runs in a browser. It's up to version 3.3 now. I think 3.4 is still in beta. Um, it runs individually on computers. It's not an enterprise application. But despite that, it's very simple to save and export and share data. And it's become particularly popular with institutions in the humanities because it's easy to use. And at first glance, it kind of looks like a more functionally advanced Excel uh, for large scale work. And to perform uh, many of these editorial and data functions and transformations, you use the GREL language, known as the General Refine Expression Language, um, to perform more advanced fixes and transforms. Most importantly, and a focus of this talk today, is uh, that it has a means to reconcile data against other data sets. Our service allows you to reconcile your terminologies against the vocabularies, terms, and data by calling our service and retrieving matches and IDs, though you could, of course, reconcile against other live services too. Wikidata has a service, VOF has a service. Um, that depends on your data and what you want to do with it. We have a tutorial online that covers all of this in greater detail, actually, but to keep things moving, I'll just run through what the basic process looks like. When you have successfully downloaded and installed OpenRefine, this is what you'll see at first, an exe file running in the background and the interface in a browser, which you use to import or create a project. You can import an Excel file, um, a CSV file, XML, JSON. It's quite versatile. There's a number of options. There's a quick close up. I know. Like I said, a lot of us are working on laptops with smaller screens. 
So after this, you create a new project. For this demonstration, I'm actually using a real project. This is a union list of artist names contribution. It's a sample contribution of artist names and accompanying data. Um, this particular example I'm using comes from the National Museum of Women and the Art, who contributed several thousand names and accompanying data to ULAN back in 2019. Um, on the left-hand side panel, you can see that OpenRefine keeps track of every change you make to the data or every process you run, and you can undo or redo anything you've worked on. And the large-scale panel here just shows your fielded data. If you scan across the data, you'll see their fields or columns, uh, such as artist names, life dates, nationality, biographies, etc. Most people's data may not look this clean, but that's okay. Uh, there's always going to be work that has to be done in almost every instance. And in fact, OpenRefine, if you've used it before, I'm sure many of you have. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming in this presentation that we have some people that are very new to this, and then some people are quite advanced. I'm trying to hit all targets a little bit in the middle. But if you've ever used OpenRefine for the first time and have dumped a whole slew of data in there, you'll immediately notice the kinds of problems you have in your own data. It makes it sadly very apparent. Before I go into general reconciliation, I wanted to show an OpenRefine editorial function or a transform that's particularly helpful, kind of explains the service a little bit, what it can do. I'll go over much more detailed transforms in a little while, but I'll start right here with a very simple one. These transforms really save an extraordinary amount of time for both data cleanup as well as aligning your data to the vocabularies. Even if you're unfamiliar with Grel um, or are maybe unsure about using that kind of programming language, uh, I can tell you it's pretty easy as far as these things go. Uh, it's a time saver and there are a number of really good tutorials online that you can just adapt and, and and play with uh, quite easily. Um, I figure if if I can actually manage some Grell, then most people can do it. I don't think that's an exaggeration. It's it, you can do it. So this one, uh, this is one in particular, uh, showing a method of editing and cleaning data in bulk. Let's say you have date values in a column that are not in the desired format. They happen to be in the day, month, year format. And you want to simply extract the year from that string and create a new column in OpenRefine with just the year from that string. You can write a very simple Grell expression shown here. I know it's small, but the value dot to date expression that you see. And it'll show you the correct value before you actually transform the data. So in the right hand column, you'll see the date string just becomes the year. Um, you can hopefully see that in a little inset there. Now, if you're working with 25,000 records, this saves a lot of time. I chose this example because our ULAN data rules actually allow only a year in that particular field. So if we're working with this data or you're working with this data and you want to make a quick change like that or extract that, that year alone, it's, it's pretty simple. Another Editorial function that's extremely helpful is called faceting. Um, let's say you want to examine all the artist roles in your artist role column, uh, such as artist, painter, watercolorist. Uh, we go to that column, we click facet, then text facet, and it brings up a count of all the values in that field so that you can quickly examine and edit them. Note the count of 45 for Sculptor. Now let's say we scroll down and we discover we want to edit the value Sculptor with a capital S and change that to be lowercase for proper syntax. We click Edit, then change the value, and then click Apply. And our count for Sculptor has changed to 49. I realize this is a very basic function, 
but I just want to show you the value it has for quickly changing data, especially when you're dealing with tens of thousands of records that may all have repeating problems and legacy issues. You can get as complex as you want with faceting. You can facet upon facet upon facet. You can facet on counts. You can facet on null values. That's very helpful. It's, it's a essential tool. Now, to reconcile to the vocabularies, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here that seem simple. Um, let's say you like to reconcile the artist name field in this spreadsheet against artists in ULAN to see if they're there. You want to create a match. Um, maybe you want to eventually just grab existing URIs from ULAN or just the IDs or perhaps you want to collect and deal with artists not in ULAN to eventually contribute. You click on the name of the field, then click on reconcile, and then start reconciling. Now we're going to assume this is the first time you've ever done this. So OpenRefine will bring up a page where you have to choose your reconciliation service. And since it's the first time you're doing it to the Getty service, you're connecting to the Getty service, you need to add our service, which is services.getty.edu slash vocab slash reconcile. And then click add service. This will stay in the software's memory. You only have to add it once. Um, even if you upgrade to a new version of OpenRefine, it stays there. So, just prior to finally reconciling these names uh, against ULAN, this pop-up will appear. And you check which vocabulary you'd like to reconcile against on the left to just check ULAN. Then on the right, you have the opportunity to include properties to hone the match. Uh, if you start typing in those fields to the right, you'll automatically get our ULAN fields in the space provided, sort of like a type ahead function. Uh, so this area matches columns on the OpenRefine project with our Getty Vocab ULAN fields. And you can choose to apply additional data in those fields against the match. So let's say in your spreadsheet you have the columns birth year and death year. To match against ULAN data, begin typing in those fields and you'll see our ULAN names for those fields, in this case birth date, death date. So we want to add birth date and death date as additional properties in this instance to help match these artists in the spreadsheet and to avoid bad matches against homographic names. Uh, the reason for this would be if you were had, let's say, an artist named Giovanni Battista Bertucci in your collection, but there are already 16 different Giovanni Bertucci's in ULAN already. You might want to add the birth and death date as additional fields, as properties to help match against the current person that you're looking for. We also recommend that you uncheck auto match in the, in the lower left. And unfortunately, we find that doing an auto match usually is problematic simply because there are so many homographic names and it's such a large body of, of data that you're querying. Then, after this, you're ready to start reconciling. So click on Start Reconciling. And this is what the results will look like once you've finished that. Depending on, it usually can take 10 seconds or it can take two minutes or three minutes. It's pretty fast, if you have a lot of records, that is. Um, you can see that it brings up potential matches in blue in order of closest match in a ranking based on the criteria you just provided, including your properties. If you want to confirm a match with ULAN, let's say you're just not sure, uh, just put your cursor over the match name uh, and it brings you a ULAN pop-up uh, and shows you the details of that record live on our website, which should help you confirm or reject that match. Now you don't necessarily have to reconcile only against names. Um, in a ULAN reconciliation project, an institution might want to match the artist roles 
or the culture slash nationality fields against AAT, uh, the Art and Architecture Thesaurus, to grab AAT IDs. So all role terms and all nationalities and cultures in ULAN are also terms in AAT. And you might want to make sure that they are consistent and match against AAT before editing your data and or contributing. Plus, in doing so, you could retrieve AAT IDs for cultures and nationalities, which you may or may not want to apply in that data. In this case, we can try here choosing this contributor's nationality column and reconcile against AAT. Let's give it a try. And then we have this, this panel again. So on the left, you want to make sure to check AAT as your vocabulary. And on the right, we can add broader EXT as a property to the preferred name field you see there. And by broader EXT, that means any broader AAT concept. Again, all these details and the reasons why you may or may not want to use these properties are explained in our tutorial. So I'm going a little quickly in the interest of time, but if you understand the AAT, you might want to check the broader uh, level to uh, hone your precise match. There are a lot of homographs in AAT as well. Usually they have qualifiers, but this may help you out. So again, we start reconciling, and the results will show you AAT terms that match the terms in the nationality field. And you can choose what matches either manually or automatically if you're really sure about your data. Uh, it pays to look very closely. Um, for example, in this top example, you see Icelandic culture style is what you want to choose at the top of the list. But below that, under the match for the term Chinese, the second term is in fact what you'd want uh, to create a match again, Chinese culture style. You do have the ability to limit your results. For example, if you're getting too many bad hits in the list, uh, with a brief click, you could limit results to display only terms with a match above say 15 or 20%. You can play with it. It makes it easier to choose the results. Uh, but then, once you're finished um, with this project and you've got everything matched as you'd like, you can export it to any of those file types that I mentioned earlier, including XML and JSON. And you, can, you could also export a list of terms that aren't in any of the vocabularies if you want to, something to work on or contribute if you separate those out or not. Um, and that's essentially, how reconciliation works with the vocabularies. Now, I've only gone over ULAN uh, because ULAN kind of connects um, AAT with the uh, roles and the nationalities slash cultures fields, but also there's a geographic element to ULAN as well when you have artists who are active somewhere or who are born or died in a place those directly connect to TGN. You could reconcile those places with TGN as well and bring back TGN IDs. So I wanted to, because I keep mentioning contributing, I, I, I put a few slides together about that very quickly as sort of a brief diversion before we get into the more advanced functions. Um, it's something we get asked about all the time we love the Getty vocabularies, we love to use them, but you know, there's some terms in there that you don't have, and I really wish you had them in there. And that's where I say, well, you know, you can become a contributor, you know, it's really easy. And it's even today, I still get a lot of people who say, really? Or it's too much work, or ah, you know, it, there, it seems like there's sometimes a barrier of inertia there. Um, and it's actually quite simple. Um, the vocabularies, as I said, are, are entirely built on contributions and they are free and all who contribute are credited. Um, whether you'd like to do that certainly depends on your institution and your projects and your workload, but it's something we certainly welcome. Um, there's our contribute page right there. Uh, the process 
usually begins with a data analysis and comparison of terms against the vocabularies to find matches. This is especially true if you have a lot of terms. Um, you obviously don't have to analyze too much if you've only got 30 terms. Um, this takes, uh, it's, we don't just accept new terms, I should also say. Um, we accept additions and corrections to records, and that happens all the time. Uh, an example might be if a certain institution prefers a specific spelling uh, of a term over another. Um, anyway, th those institutions can be credited for precisely the ones, that the terminologies that they prefer in their data. It doesn't matter either, either way because it's a thesaurus, so these terms are exact synonyms. Um, after that analysis, you may want to review our guidelines um, for any info on required fields for, for a particular vocabulary. That's pretty straightforward. Then please contact us and we can move forward discussing the scope of your data, the format, sometimes signing a letter of agreement if that's necessary. Uh, we have a uh, online a letter of agreement now that can be zipped right through, uh, and you can submit data in XML or in a spreadsheet. There are numerous benefits to this process, but one primary one is that your credited data is published as linked open data, enabling other systems to harness it with your credit attached to whatever you've contributed, along with a unique identifier. And Another question I'm asked a lot is how people use the vocabularies. And the plain answer is that most people who use them, use them internally uh, in their own cataloging system or collection management system. But more and more, especially in the linked open data world, the desire to link outward, not just to our vocabularies, but to any reputable standard has become very important. So here are a few examples that you can actually see online. There's quite a few of them, but I pulled a few. This is Europeana, who links to our classification terminologies. Uh, the Yale Center for British Art is one pretty good example of, uh, uh, of a museum that links directly to our subject terms in AAT describing art, uh, places in TGN that are represented or have something to do with an artist's work, and the artist's names in ULAN. And there's their back end there I showed there as well. Um, the RKD uh, in the Netherlands is a longtime partner uh, with us. They, in fact, have uh, produced the Dutch translation of the AAT, um, and they use for object category and support medium here in this description of a work, they link right back to the AAT. And you can directly link to the terms if you need to. There's a Chinese translation based out of Taiwan at the Academia Sinica of the AAT in two different types of Chinese and transliterated Chinese as well. Uh, there's one um, for Spanish speakers based out of Santiago, Chile. Uh, that's a long time project that's gone on for many years. And then you have museums like Portland Art Museum, uh, that simply extract our data and use it to help populate their cataloging records online or their, their records for artwork online, um, including here the Portland using the preferred term paintings and they grabbed uh, data from ULAN. Dallas Art Museum, very similar process. They used uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York does something very similar. Uh, the Te Papa Museum in New Zealand was partnering for quite some time, giving us Maori terms. And we are part of VIOF, ULAN is anyway, since since VIOF is uh, based on people, entities. And we are in Wikipedia under the authority control, or ULAN is, although I'm not sure actually who did this. We didn't. Uh, they took our data once and some of it is actually incorrect. So we're going back to investigate um, how we can do that ourselves and submit it ourselves. But just thought I'd throw that out there. 
normally uh, this would be a moment when I would ask for questions, but mm, I'm going to wait till the end uh, just because that's the protocol. So save your questions and now we'll get into some deep stuff. Right, so here I'll discuss more advanced work with the vocabularies in relation, uh, uh, more advanced functions of open refine in relation to the vocabularies. Um, and as I said, I've chosen some examples here that have been directly mentioned by our contributors in the past. Some of you might find them relevant, some of them are pretty dense. Uh, but I wanted to show them just to show the robustness of the system itself. So here's a real simple one. Let's grab vocabulary IDs for matching records. First thing you want to do by, is add a new column based on your column of, in this case, reconciled ULAN names, the same file that we were looking at before. You can name your column something like ULAN ID, and then type a short grel expression, which is cell.recon.match.id. And then type a, uh, and then uh, you can see under the column to the right that it grabs each ID and displays it below. You can easily edit out that, that ULAN slash prefix with a global edit, or unless you'd like to keep it. And really that's it, then you're done. Now let's show how we can actually sync Getty vocabulary IDs through our up-to-date XML web services using OpenRefine. OpenRefine normally calls our web data, but our most up-to-date data is queryable in OpenRefine by calling the XML web services. This is different from our LOD data sets, which are queryable using Sparkle. I mentioned this as it's an issue that came up with some contributors who either send us bulk data regularly, say every year or two, or to reconcile their own giant segment of records with our IDs regularly. The question is for them, how do we know if our ULAN IDs on our side have remained the same or have changed over time? Usually, we would rarely change unique identifiers, but every once in a while it does happen that there are, for example, our duplicates in, uh, in or, or an issue, uh, let's say a Renaissance painter was firmly identified as a anonymous master, master of the something something. Um, and through scholarship, it was proven that they actually are the same person. That's a case where we would probably merge those two records together and put a note in the ULAN record saying, scholarship has shown that the master of so-and-so is actually this Renaissance painter or something like that. Um, that would be, then the ID would change. We would merge the master ID into the artist and that ID would disappear. Um, it's not a big deal for most people and most people using the vocabularies, they wouldn't even notice. However, for people who incorporate our data into their system, like all of it, some people do, um, or have a giant seg segment of their IDs uh, matched to ours, they may want to run some services to check that that data is still exact and sound. And this is a way you could actually do that. So going by our, going from our prior expression, um, you go to your ULAN ID column and add a column by fetching URLs. Next, you define your column name. Let's call it sync ID and write your grel expression. This is more complicated. I'm not going to read it out loud, but it's you can see, and if you look closely, ULAN get sync subject ID question mark subject ID plus value. Um, but you're going to compare the current subject ID for the term. And this is the resulting XML in a column. Now to edit, you go to edit cells, 
and then transform. We're going to edit those XML fields. So you want to perform a custom text transform in, in this instance on this XML to just simply parse out the ID. Uh, and you can use the parse XML uh, expression shown here. So value parse XML. Again, I'm not going to read this. We'll make this available. But most importantly, you can see that on the right-hand column, uh, the ULAN ID or the matched current ULAN ID appears. A sync ID in that second column. So if you do that with 10,000 records, you'll be able to parse out the differences. Something like that would be you match against sync ID and ULAN ID in one column or two columns. Right? So. Now, uh, let's say you want to enrich your own records with additional vocabulary data. This could also be helpful. Uh, there's plenty of relevant data in ULAN records apart from just the artist's name uh, and dates. And again, you can do this by calling our XML web services through OpenRefine. So uh, let's add a column based on your sync ID column, and let's call it ULAN XML. And the grel expression there uh, instructs OpenRefine to grab the entire XML for that ULAN record. It's going to be a big chunk. And in this next slide, you will see it is indeed a big chunk of data. But let's say that you only want to grab our preferred biography for that person uh, out of that XML. Preferred biography is a required field for ULAN. Um, it's very simple. It's usually uh, nationality slash culture plus roles plus birth date or active date, whatever uh, it is. And that's it, sort of like a wall text kind of thing. Um, you can create a new column, parse out the XML with this Grell expression here. With the Grell expressions are getting longer and longer, but you can see we're extracting the preferred biography. Um, and it basically uh, brings you what you see there, Scottish painter and architect in the lower right. This can be very helpful, again, when you're dealing with thousands of records. And this is an example of here where you You've got all the preferred biographies from ULAN matching against those artists. Uh, a number of museums simply use our preferred biography on their collections pages, on their website, and well, you never know, could be useful. I wanted to show it. You may also want to include ULAN variant names in your system and need a means to grab those specifically. Uh, Going back just one step, we're going to parse the XML one more time. And you can see in the Grell, we're parsing XML for non-preferred terms. So when you do that, you see in the lower right, you're getting the additional variant terms for that person, including uh, an indexed or an index and a display name for that person. And then you can put those variant names in a column next to the display name. And the reason why you may want to include variant names in your data is that it simply helps for indexing. A similar uh, question comes up with TGN, sometimes the thesaurus of geographic names. Let's say you have a list of TGN IDs that you've matched, and that's it. And you want to know if you can. Uh, grab the preferred term and then the current coordinates in OpenRefine for places in TGN. But you want to do it from the live Sparkle endpoint. This is something that came up as well. Yes, you actually can query the large, live Sparkle endpoint from OpenRefine instead of parsing the XML. And in this time, instead of parsing XML, you're going to parse JSON. So first, create a new column to fetch the URLs based on TGN IDs that we'll assume you have, querying the Sparkle endpoint in the Grell expression.
and applying this next expression, you can parse the JSON to grab the preferred term in its own column. That's actually a pretty simple expression for parsing JSON. Then, the more difficult part is creating another column based on those IDs, but this time fetch the JSON, uh, fetch from JSON to grab latitude and longitude coordinates. And we want to parse that with just those lat and long values with a comma separator. So conceivably, you could enrich your own data just like that for example. Now, I realize that's a lot right there, so I think I may quit while I'm ahead, except to say that, as always, we've documented these processes online. Uh, and this is the direct link for our OpenRefine documentation through which you can follow um, all of these issues that I've just mentioned. Um, and I'm happy to turn it over for questions. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Um, it looks like we do have a couple questions so far. I'm hoping we see more. Um, first question is, is, um, is there any documentation about fetching URLs with the uh, TGN API? It's just the same as what we discussed. I used ULAN as an example uh, because it's simple, but you would do the exact same process. You would just query TGM, and you can query any field and pull back and match against any field that's in TGM using the exact same process. I just use ULAN um, because it's easy to think about names and matching against people, but that's exactly the same thing you can do with TGM. I think I've got that right, unless you have a more specific question. Um, I think that answered the, uh, okay, so follow-up, that was for the reconciliation? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, next question. Uh, to enrich data in OpenRefine, uh, in addition to fetching XML, could you pull, pull from a LID version of the Getty's vocabs using uh, the add column based on reconciled values? So that's a more specific question. Yes, um, that's why I kind of showed the Sparkle endpoint. I, I think you're asking about LOD, is that right? Did I get that correct? Linked open data, yeah. The question is about linked open data or yes. the LOD version of the Getty vocabs. Right, and that would be the last example. It's more complicated. Um, if you may have better luck querying just with Sparkle. Uh, rather querying our LOD because we have an we have a Sparkle endpoint where you can we have maybe 200 uh, sample queries to pull data directly from our live LOD uh, from a Sparkle endpoint. You may only want to do that, but the thing with with OpenRefine is that you can pull from our Sparkle endpoint using OpenRefine based on a list of your own matched IDs with the Sparkle query. You don't go into a Sparkle query with a whole list of your own IDs already. You're more pulling information from the data in a different way. Um, that's why I wanted to show that example. But yes, you can do that, and then you can parse the JSON, as I showed before. Um, yeah, I think I get that. Now, bear in mind, uh, I should say this, actually, as a, as a slight diversion. Um, the Getty vocabulary program is comprised of metadata and content people like myself. We are not programmers. Um, that said, we have to know a little bit about how to do this at the very least. And we work directly with Getty Digital, which is the new um, branch of the Getty where they've sort of uh, coordinated all the um, digital and, and you know, programming forces. Um, to work directly with all the institutes. This is based out of the Getty Research Institute, but um, in order for this to be pulled off, we have to work directly with a senior programmer from top to bottom, someone who actually knows our data, understands how it works. Um, for anyone doing this, this is very difficult 
and and it it's it demands a lot of resources and also a lot of communication. Um, it's hard to pull someone off the street and have them just immediately understand vocabulary data, especially one that's been around for uh, many years. Um, so while we editors use Grell and use this service, um, we get a lot of questions that are more difficult for, for us to answer. Um, and we have to go to our, our programmers and say, this is what this person is asking, how do we work this? So what I'm saying is that a lot of this that I've shown, especially in the last segment, stuff that I would not do myself, I don't need to. It's something for our users to do. Um, and not being a programmer makes it even more difficult to describe how it works. Um, I think this is an issue that is across the field. Uh, that's you know blending the techn technological with the content-based um, work and how that never exactly dovetails quite nicely a lot of people learn on the job and on the fly how to do this because they have to um, oh I guess I need to learn Grell now or I guess I need to learn uh, SQL or, or anything like that and that's it's not too dissimilar from us as well um, I think it's probably all I should stop now for those other questions. Okay, uh, so there's a request that you go back by one slide so folks can grab the URL off the slide. Yeah, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then let's see here. Um, I might go to another uh, unique asker before I double back to any follow-up questions. Um, so we have, uh, someone asking, is it possible to add more vocabularies to reconcile against um, beyond ULAN, TGN, AT? Like, this was also kind of a question I had. Um, like, is it possible to add uh, LCSH or, you know, other vocabularies? Yes, of course, if they have a service. Not all vocabularies have an open refine uh, reconciliation service. They may not. Uh, but I think. I know VOF has and Wikidata has, and if LC probably does. Um, I've not used it myself, uh, but if they do, then absolutely you can query it, query it the same way. Okay. All right. All right. So it looks like we have some follow up questions. Here's one um, asking What was the development process like for creating the reconciliation endpoint and integrating into OpenRefine? It actually, what we've been lucky, we've 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 had a senior programmer, <coughs> pardon me, uh, who's worked with us for 20 years, and knows the data very well. And it was actually at his um, instigation that we investigate OpenRefine. He liked the program a lot. We we liked the program a lot because of its simplicity, and we thought it would be a good way to, um, you know, bridge these these whatever barriers or perceived barriers more likely between Con contributions and getting loading data into the vocabularies on a more regular basis. Um, we have all different kinds of contributors. We have people who write in with one term that needs to be changed, and we have. I'm working right now in OpenRefine on a, um, a batch of 25,000 Austrian artists from an institution in Austria. It's extremely complicated. Uh, and, and very, very messy. Um, and how much of that messiness has to be cleaned up by the institution itself or by us? Well, obviously, we'd like to get data clean all the time because we're just such a small staff, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, so we wanted to develop this program, uh, this service, and it was basically developed by Getty Digital on their own. Um, again, it's only three of our vocabularies. Uh, the cultural object name authority is not does not have a reconciliation service yet, um, probably because it's not really LOD yet, and we're it's still a vocabulary very much in development. Same with our iconography authority. We're still working on those, planning the future for those vocabularies. It's a long term thing, you know. We have board meetings and steering committees and discussions about where that will go. So right now, the three. Uh, core vocabularies are in the service. Um, 
if you have any more detailed questions about that, I can I can get okay. to it. Uh, uh, but okay. it's been in development for two years, and we launched the service um, last uh, September, I think, at the CDOC um, conference. The ICOM conference in last September was in the first time I presented on it. But since then, it's actually gone through a number of changes, which are for the better. Sounds good. Yeah, the moving a, a control vocabulary to linked open data is never a smooth or fast process because there are usually large communities involved and uh, folks need to agree on how best to proceed. So it takes time. Yes. And I should say that wow. once you've made your data into linked open data, that doesn't mean that it stops. You may have to completely mm -hmm. do a version 2.0, which we're actually working on now. Uh, the next iteration of our LOD will probably be, uh, you know, in using the CDOC uh, conceptual reference model, uh, the CRM. But that may mean that the LOD actually will change. Um, this is, you know, looking into the future. It's something we've been working on for a while, but we're going from what we have to maybe a, 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 another step, a lateral step, a different step, because more and more people are using the CRM. We want to make sure that we have our data available to to match that that format. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, quick question about the Sparkle example. Uh, so the asker says it was perfect for their use case, um, but they're wondering if the examples are documented someplace. Yes, all of these examples are documented. They'll be this. I assume this will be. Um, online, this presentation, of course, but also mm -hmm. uh, going to our OpenRefine page, um, there's plenty of documentation right there that will help you even further, especially when you're dealing with things like um, properties and, and such and such. But all the JSON example that you just saw will be there as well. Excellent. But I'm actually really okay. glad to hear that, that that works for people. I'm glad that's that's good to know. I wasn't sure if uh, it was so, be too deep. Or I think there's been a lot of uh, uptake in the last few years uh, regarding yeah. Sparkle and triple stores. Uh -huh. uh, so we, in fact, we're going to launch into another Sparkle question about the Sparkle endpoint. Um, uh -huh. Does it support additional response types beyond JSON? It, like, is it possible for someone to get Turtle from it or RDFX ML? Yes, I think all of our records are in those formats as well, and you can request that. In fact, I think if you just go to any one record on our vocabulary pages, you can grab the turtle or grab the RDF from from each individual page. So I'm almost positive you can query that from the from the Sparkle page. All right. So it looks like um, I'm gonna read it. It takes up so much space on the interface here. Um, we have another follow-up. Um, the asker mentions the, the add column based on reconciled bot values menu option in OpenRefine um, uh, does not seem to be supported by the Getty's endpoints. An example of an endpoint that uses the data extension API is the wiki data endpoint. Uh, okay. Could you read that question again a little slower, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the asker says, I just tried using the add column based on reconciled values menu option in OpenRefine, which uses the data extension API. But this is not supported by the Getty's endpoint. I think they mean Sparkle endpoint. Um, oh, right. Yeah, that's you. Yes. Yeah, I think you have to use the web XML web services for that. But again, that's a question that I would probably have to go back to get an, uh, an official answer from Getty Digital on that, um, because I'm not entirely sure. But I can definitely ask about it. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know offhand, but I'll find out. Okay, and then uh, looks like we have a question here um, related to uh, metadata standards. The Darwin Core standard 
which is modeled on Dublin Core, uh, but it's specifically for biodiversity data, recommends the use of TGN for geographic term values. Um, they would like to build services that call TGN with a user's geographic feature name and then get a preferred value to use in developing and searching against indexes. Are the services robust enough to serve a use case like this? Absolutely, but you should know that the TGN feature names are terms in AAT. So you would actually, if you add, imagine the spreadsheet that we just looked at, and you want to query uh, feature names, you would query AAT for that within your body work. TGN is places, but each record in TGN contains all this ancillary information related to the place. TGN is specifically a thesaurus for places and coordinates, but you would, the data related to physical features descriptions, that would be in AAT, and all of that data is in there. You could easily query it using this, this uh, service. Excellent. Well, I see it's uh, three minutes to the hour, and I don't see any additional questions. So I think we might call it a wrap. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you, Jonathan, for presenting. Of course, and anyone can uh, email me uh, jward at getty.edu. Why didn't I put that on there? I apologize. It's jward at getty.edu. Uh, if you want to email me any additional questions, you can write me anytime. Um, yeah. Great Happy to check in. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. What a great presentation and a lot of interaction with the audience. So uh, thank you, Jacob, for moderating the session and doing well with all the questions. Um, I just want to remind those in attendance that uh, one of the uh, many ACES member benefits is complimentary access to all of our webinars. Uh, a recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides will be posted to the ACES website uh, within a couple of days, and they'll be available to all paid registrants and ACES members. Uh, within 24 hours, you're also going to receive um, an email with the recording in there and also a survey, which I really encourage you to please complete and uh, within seven days so we can share that in information uh, with uh, Jonathan and Jacob. Again, I'm Kathy Nash with the ACES staff, and I thank you for attending today's webinar. This concludes our session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.